That's why okay. I think, uh, especially those in South, Southeast Asia region and those around the world who are joining us for the first webinar of uh, the WHO Southeast Asia region 2022 antimicrobial stewardship webinar series. So this webinar series responds to the demand from member states for guidance on how to implement comprehensive and integrated antimicrobial stewardship activities in a programmatic approach anchored in uh, public health guiding principles. Uh, just a few housekeeping issues. This webinar will be predominantly conducted in English. As an attendee, your audio and video will be muted during the webinar. You can type your questions in the Q&A section. Um, please feel free to direct any specific, uh, to any specific panelist if you wish. Use the chat box as a back channel for chats, discussions, comments that you may have. You can please feel free to test it. Type in the chat box your name, your affiliated organization, and your profession. In case we cannot answer all the questions in time, we will share uh, the written responses by the end of next week uh, and copies of the presentation. So as you can see, we have an exciting agenda ahead of us. And today's webinar will mainly focus on antimicrobial resistance national action plan implementation. So before I introduce the panelists who are joining us, uh, let me at this point in time uh, introduce to you uh, Ms. Eugene Kim, who is the regional advisor in the WHO Southeast Asia region regional office in the essential drugs and other medicine units. Thank you very much, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening colleagues and participants. Welcome to the first antimicrobial stewardship webinar series from the WHO regional office for the Southeast Asia. As countries are tackling COVID-19 pandemic, we have witnessed increased irrational use of medicines, including inappropriate prescribing of antimicrobials and self-medication based on patient perceptions. AMA threatens the progress achieved in medical science and public health. It is estimated that AMR is responsible for around 700,000 deaths annually and impacts progress towards sustainable development goals, including the good health and well-being of nations. As a result, AMR has been identified as one of the region's flagship priorities and all countries in the Southeast Asia region continue to tackle action to prevent and combat AMR. The member states have developed and are implementing national action plans. They have established multi-sectoral AMR committees and working groups adopting one health approach, prioritizing actions at the human, animal, environmental uh, interface. WHO Regional Office for the Southeast Asia region is part of the Tripartite Plus, working closely with FAO and OIE and now initiating discussions with UNEP and the World Bank. Seattle is a region where all member states carry out annual tripartite AMR country self-assessment surveys. However, despite the achievements and progress made so far, challenges remain in the countries in terms of timely access to needed antimicrobials, linking surveillance data into action, effective infection prevention and control, rational prescribing and use, and regulation of antimicrobial sales in the market. To sustain and accelerate the momentum, it is important to raise awareness in the public and key stakeholders working in human, animal, and environmental health. Capacity building initiatives for healthcare workers must continue to emphasize rational and quality use of medicines. Also, amid intense fiscal pressures, increased domestic allocations are needed to tackle AMR. 
While COVID-19 pandemic has diverted much needed resources and attention and control measures such as travel bans and lockdowns compromised our ways of interaction and learning, it, is, it has also provided an opportunity via <clears throat> uh, virtual platforms to reach wider audiences around the world. Sierra is now organizing a monthly webinar series on antimicrobial stewardship to learn from the experts and from the countries on best practices and how to translate policy into action on the ground. The webinar series will be covering a wide range of topics considering the complexity of tackling AMR from national action plans, antimicrobial stewardship programs, consumption monitoring, rational use, strengthening laboratory surveillance and IPC to one health approach. As the first of its series, we will be covering National Action Plan today, which is a guiding framework to tackle various components of AMR in the member states. We look forward to your active participation and fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Hello, am I loud and clear? Yes, you are. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jean, for uh, the very kind, warm uh, opening remarks. Um, as we kickstart the webinar today, allow me to introduce me, Dr. Sarah Pauling. Dr. Sarah Pauling is a technical officer in, in uh, antimicrobial resistance division in uh, WHO Geneva. So she has been actively involved uh, recently in the development of uh, the uh, national um, an antimicrobial, uh, antimic NAP, antimicrobial resistance um, um, and, uh, um, implementation handbook. So she will actually go in detail uh, on the implementation handbook. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Sarah. Thank you, Terence, and thank you, Jin, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of those joining from around the world, in particular, a warm welcome to the participants from the Southeast Asia region. I'm delighted to be here with you today um, to present to you on sort of the global status of national action plans, as well as, as Terence has mentioned, on a newly launched WHO implementation handbook that we hope will really support countries as they move towards comprehensive and programmatic implementation of their national action plans. Um, as Terence has mentioned, my name is Sarah Paulin and I work in the National Action Plan and Monitoring and Evaluation Unit in the AMR Division and WHO Headquarters. Again, delighted to be here today. So as you know, I thought I would just give a very few very brief background. As you know, antimicrobial resistance has many factors contributing to it. It is a natural phenomenon, but it is also accelerated by various factors, in particular, the biggest drivers being the misuse or overuse of antimicrobials in the human sector, but also in other sectors. And hence why integrated antimicrobial stewardship programs are really vital to tackle one of these major factors. We also know that antimicrobial resistance, given that drivers and the responses needed, not only within the human health sector and within different programs, but also across sectors. And so it demands a really a comprehensive One Health and multi-sectoral approach. And this is why it is great that One Health is also part of this broader webinar series. Just to bring us back to where it started globally, and I know that in Sierra it started even earlier, is that in 2015, um, the Global Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance was endorsed by all member states. And this really laid what we would say the blueprint for countries who had not yet developed national action plans to commence development and implementation following guidelines, these five key strategic objectives that broadly focus on improving awareness and understanding, strengthening the knowledge and evidence base, primarily through surveillance, 
reducing the incidence of infections so that we don't need to use the antibiotics in the first place, optimizing the use of the existing antimicrobials that we do have. And of course, one of the key components here is antimicrobial stewardship programs and their activities at all levels of the healthcare system. And finally, developing the economic case for sustainable investment, which also includes research and development into new antimicrobials, alternatives, diagnostics, and vaccines. And just to show you on the next slide, that there are many components that fall under these strategic objectives. You don't need to look at this in depth, but I thought what would be good just to show you is I'm going to show you progress in some key areas globally, and Terence will then go into the details of how countries in the Southeast Asia region are progressing when it comes to governance. And this, of course, sits above the strategic objectives. We need effective coordination governance. So I will cover where countries are when it comes to multi-sectoral working groups, the development and overall implementation of national action plans, but also these key areas that all are related indirectly or directly to antimicrobial stewardship, being education and training on antimicrobial resistance, national AMR, but also antimicrobial consumption and use surveillance systems, infection prevention control, looking at regulations, on antimicrobial use and sales, antimicrobial stewardship as a whole, and also finally the adoption of AWARE, which I know that many countries actually in the Southeast Asia region have moved forward. So how do we monitor this progress? On an annual basis, the tripartite, which has now become the quadripartite, having UNEP join WHO, FAO, and OIE, we conduct an annual self-assessment survey of countries. And the survey includes indicators across various dimensions, as I mentioned here on the slides. But what is important to say is that we measure indicators from a level of A to E, where C is already an area and level we consider national implementation. So if your country has reached C, you are in a good starting point, acknowledging there is still more progress to be made for sustainable implementation until you reach E. We received the highest number of responses in 2021, which was surprising given COVID, of course, has taken a lot of our time and effort. So let me run you through some of these data. In all of the slides, you will see the global number in gray, the global bar, but in comparison also where Sierra countries as a region compared to the global level. And then Terence will run you much more in detail in terms of which countries are specifically in which areas. So let's start. Overall, national action plans, there's been an incredible increase over the last five years in the development of national action plans. We now have roughly 140 countries that responded to the survey last year having developed national action plans. However, it's one thing to develop these national action plans. That's the second really to implement and actively monitor and as you can see, all Sierra countries already have their national action plan, but when you look globally, this is not the case. And secondly, globally, we only have about 32 countries that are also actively monitoring implementation. And only this is really where we reach sustainable implementation. Secondly, given that it is a multi-sectoral issue and also within the health sector cuts across not only AMR, but also UHC, primary health care, immunization, et cetera. We need strong governance. And here at a global level, only approximately 50% of countries actually have functioning multi-sectoral working groups, which, and I think Sierra, it's, it looks like you're relatively similar, maybe a slightly higher than the global average. And so it shows we still have a long way to go to really ensure that these are functional to, and to ensure that we have integrated approaches across the sectors when implementing national action plans. Now let me dive into the technical areas I mentioned. First being training and education on antimicrobial resistance within the human health sector. We know that having pre and in-service training in particular for our healthcare professionals is vital also for antimicrobial stewardship programs. And here I'm really heartened to see that about almost 80% of countries do have some level of pre and in-service training. However, only 99% of countries globally have actually formally introduced this and are systematically 
incorporating pain and surface training nationwide. So we still have a ways to go here. Secondly, when it comes to national AMR surveillance systems, of course, we need to have the evidence base to then inform evidence-based and, uh, and interventions, but also the prioritization of interventions. And here, there's been quite a lot of efforts over the years to establish national AMR surveillance systems. And as we can see, this has also paid off with 74% of countries globally, but also I'm quite happy to see the Sierra numbers here, having national AMR surveillance systems of some level that they're able to collect data. However, these are not always standardized. And as you can see, less than half of the countries actually have a standardized surveillance system with a national reference laboratory. So again, here, and I can see Sierra numbers are actually quite high, 73% of the Sierra member states do have a national reference laboratory and a, and a systematic approach. So this is great. Globally, we still have quite a ways to go. Secondly, we also need to have evidence on the flip side on antimicrobial use and sales to inform appropriate prescribing. And here, there's again been quite a lot of effort in trying to establish the systems for sustainability. And it is taking a bit longer. So we only have just over half of all countries that are at the moment monitoring sales or consumption of antimicrobials at a national level. However, sales and consumption, of course, only tells us part of the story. We also need to inform appropriate prescribing. And this is where we need to ensure we also are taking samples at healthcare facilities but that are nationally representative on, for example, point prevalence surveys on appropriate prescribing. And this is where we still have quite a bit of effort to go. Moving into IPC, of course, IPC and antimicrobial stewardship, we often say they are two sides of the same coin and really do go hand in hand. And again, IPC is an area that still needs a lot of strength and it has had a lot of attention during COVID, which is fantastic, but we need to ensure that this is sustained. And globally, we currently have 108 countries that have a national IPC program and plan, and that is being implemented in some healthcare facilities. But when you look at the numbers of nationwide implementation in healthcare facilities, it drops quite quickly down to 15%. Um, so we also here need to ensure that we strengthen this together with our antimicrobial stewardship programs. Now moving into the core, or I would say the heart of the areas related to antimicrobial stewardship. The first being regulation on antimicrobial use in human health. Acknowledging having a regulation, for example, that only ensures sales are with a prescription by a healthcare professional is only part of the story. We need to ensure the enforcement of the regulations, of course, as well. But it's heartening to see that actually we have globally, most of the countries, sorry, there's a small area here, about 91% of the countries that do have regulations in place. And in Sierra countries, this is 100%, which is fantastic. Let's make sure that these are also enforced and that we really do put this into practice. Secondly, when it comes to policies on optimizing antimicrobial use in the human health sector. Again, this is an area that has had quite a bit of <clears throat> progress over the years. In particular, I can also see that in the Sierra region, the numbers are relatively high. Roughly, we have 71% of countries globally that have some activities implemented in some healthcare facilities. However, when it comes to actually having guidelines, for example, on optimizing use implemented for all syndromes, and that data on prescribing is actually fed back to the prescribers, this again drops significantly to 60% globally, and, and unfortunately we're at 0% in Sierra. So this is an area where countries have made progress, fantastic progress of probably establishing the structures for antimicrobial stewardship, and now we need to move to the sustainable implementation and ultimately the behavior change. And finally, but last but not least, of course, the adoption of aware international essential medicines lists, but also into, for example, stewardship strategies. Here we have, and 
be it that AWARE was only adopted a few years ago, so we haven't had as much time to implement, <clears throat> excuse me. 59 countries globally so far have adopted the AWARE classification into the National Essential Medicines list, but we still need to move, and as you can see also in the Sierra region, into A, monitoring our antimicrobial consumption by the AWARE classification to know actually are we using up to 60% of the access antibiotics, which is the global indicator, or are we using more watch and reserve and we should target that as stewardship interventions? And finally, also only 10% of countries globally have incorporated AWARE into antimicrobial stewardship strategies. So as you can see in summary, we still have, I would say different levels of, of implementation across the technical areas related to antimicrobial stewardship, but national action plans in total, and so we still need to ensure that we build the capacities at country levels, the structures for sustainable implementation. And this is why, and I'll very briefly go through this, why last week WHO launched the WHO Implementation Handbook for National Action Plans on Antimicrobial Resistance for the Human Health Sector that tries to provide practical stepwise guidance. And importantly, I think for those implementing a collation of the WHO tools currently available for each of the steps, for implementation as well as a checklist. Very briefly, the six steps follow a continuous process, starting with strengthening governance, as we saw that's an, it's an important area, we still have a ways to go. Prioritizing activities based on evidence-based. Once you have your prioritized activities to actually cost your operational plan to identify what are your funding gaps to enable resource mobilization to then enable the sustainable implementation of activities. And finally, last but not least, of course, we need to monitor and evaluate to see if our interventions are actually reaching the intended output and impact, and also to adapt our implementation. And I will go very quickly, as I think I'm slowly running out of time, just to show you what the details look like. And so when it comes to strengthening governance, it's important, and there's guidance for each of these steps, is that you establish a national and where necessary a subnational governance structure that may include or should include a national multi-sectoral coordination mechanism or working group, which may be supported by an AMR secretariat. But importantly as well, is that as is needed, technical working groups that are really the implementers are established to then take forward the implementation of activities. And one of these could be, for example, a technical working group on optimized use or antimicrobial stewardship. Secondly, we need to actually prioritize activities for a given time, let's say two to three years. And what does this entail? We need to review the current situation and there are various tools available to identify what are our implementation goals within each of the strategic objectives, to know where we want to go, to then identify what are the activities that will get us there based on where we are. And then using an agreed upon scope and approach we recommend a participatory approach and potentially a matrix such as the one shown here in an implementation handbook to then actually score and prioritize your activities to then move forward and utilizing tools such as the WHO costing and budgeting tool to actually develop and cost your prioritized activities within the operational plan, uh, plan which ultimately will show you what your funding gap is by strategic objective, but also by intervention area to then enable you to go forward for mobilizing your resources. And here we recommend to first leverage domestic resources, for example, in existing programs such as universal health coverage, primary health care, um, immunization, et cetera, to then where there are gaps map what other potential funders could actually fund your activities. And here it might be helpful to develop a funder map and finally to actually present an investment case or a resource mobilization advocacy case to potential funders to increase your resources. To then move forward with implementation of your prioritized activities. And here we have collated all of the WHO tools by strategic objective, but also by the level of um, implementation. 
And here I've just pulled out a short excerpt, for example, on tools available on antimicrobial stewardship. There are more. But as you can see, for example, there is guidance at the healthcare facility, but also two guidances at the national and facility level available in multiple languages. And we encourage you to work with internal and external stakeholders for sustainable implementation. And to finally monitor and, and evaluate the progress. And again, we provide tools available for you. And we really recommend that this is, often, that this is undertaken regularly, perhaps by the technical working group and or the multi-sectoral coordinating mechanism, depending on your structure. We encourage you to review the tracks data that you're submitting to WHO on an annual basis, and really to ensure you are also including all of the activities being conducted by implementing partners, including, for example, also the private sector, civil society, academia, et cetera. And finally, to communicate your progress. There is so much fantastic work happening at all levels um, in countries, and we need to ensure that we communicate this not only to our policymakers, but I think also to the community at large. It is part of also our awareness raising. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Just wanted to say that as a next step, we are developing an e-learning course on the implementation handbook, as well as creating this into an online living document which we will continue to update as soon as new guidance has become available from all levels of WHO. And with that, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the excellent presentation. And uh, thank you for taking us through the progress that has been made in the implementation of NAPS and the different levels of implementation and capacities that are um, they globally, and also you have highlighted the regional progress in Southeast Asia region. And also for taking us through the steps, the six step continuous process of NAP implementation. Uh, one thing that you have highlighted is that um, there is uh, maybe low um, functional multi-sectorial working groups that are currently um, active uh, globally. Uh, from your experience, maybe can I ask you to just share the experiences of other countries in terms of implementing functional multi-sectorial working groups and how maybe as a region in Southeast Asia can be able to learn from what is happening globally? Over to you. Thank you, Terence. This is a fantastic question and not an easy one because it's very, every country is very different. But I think at a minimum, what is really important and what has worked in other countries is the leadership commitment at the highest level to establish these working groups. Because if you can convince even up to, let's say, the Minister of Health level or in some countries, the Prime Minister's office, there will be dedicated funds available at least for a secretariat function function within the multi-sectoral working group that will allow this to, to actually run on a, on a, I would say, monthly or quarterly basis. Secondly, you need the commitment across the, the sectors, because at the end of the day, the, in particular the multi-sectoral working groups, you need involvement of not only the human health sector, but you need agriculture, animal health, and also more and more environment, and I would like to say education and finance as well. And so countries that have been successful in this case have taken a lot of time to raise awareness within the other sectors and the policymakers of the other sectors. I would say thirdly, it is important that a structure is endorsed, but also that the individuals sitting within the structure are accountable, are empowered to actually take decisions and take action. And so I think that those are probably the most critical elements. And then of course, to ensure that there is perhaps, and this is maybe not only for multi-sectoral working groups, but this is the case for implementation, I think of all areas, is to have a champion. If you have a champion who is really passionate about this, then they will ensure the continuous running and that actually we are moving forward. So I think those are my, initial key takeaways and lessons learned from countries. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you very much for the excellent response. I hope uh, we'll also be able to learn from what is happening uh, in the globally. Another question that is coming up is that uh, how does the budget tool 
uh, help in the financial mobilization as this is one of the challenges faced to implement NAP on AMS strategies? Again, very, very good question. And I think also I agree, this is one of the biggest challenges is mobilizing, I would say, sustainable resources for implementation because often at the moment, and we're grateful for the support but at the moment, it is often donor and project based and so time limited. Uh, the costing, the WHO, um, sorry, I have the light shining right in me. I hope you can see me. The WHO um, costing and budgeting tool enables, be it the whole national action plan, prioritized activities only, for example, for antimicrobial stewardship programs, for you to cost really the line items of what each activity will cost. I think that's an important starting point because if we don't know what we need to ask for, how can we convince anyone to give us money? Secondly, there are often funds, even if it's minor, there are some funds coming towards certain activities. And I think it's important to show what funding is available. So again, this the costing budgeting tool allows you to also include the funds that are available. And importantly, then to identify the very concrete funding gap you have for specific activities, because this you can then actually bring in to an investment case or into an advocacy document and bring to, be it the national government within the Ministry of Health, but also to external partners to really have a concrete ask of what you need. And so this is, we hope, as is an initial first step to enable you to have that conversation with potential donors. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we move on to our next presentation. And uh, let me just start sharing the screen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, at this point in time, I'll go through the results of the tripartite AMR country self-assessment survey, the TREX 21, 2021 Southeast Asia region. Um, so um, the annual tripartite AMR country self-assessment uh, survey is a component that of the broad approach for monitoring and evaluating uh, the global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. The analysis followed uh, four out of five strategic objectives of the gap that require immediate country action on AMR. An analysis was conducted to evaluate whether countries had advanced to nationwide implementation over the years, represented by a scale from A to E um, on the scale. A, showing no capacity. B, showing limited capacity. C, developed capacity. D, demonstrated capacity. And E, sustained capacity. So first of all, on the implementation of NAP and the progress that has been made in Southeast Asia region. We noted that um, all countries in Southeast Asia region have developed an, a NAP on AMR and over 90% have implemented their NAP with 27% uh, actively monitoring their implementation. The key uh, issues that are coming up is identifying funding sources. I think from the previous uh, presentation, we've also learned that and allocating funding to AMR NAP is key to effective implementation. On multi-sectorial working groups, in Southeast Asia region, 82% uh, of the countries in the region uh, reported having functional multi-sectorial working groups on AMR with clear TORs and regular meetings and funding for working group activities. If we go to the technical objectives uh, on the objective number one of the gap, we realize that 82% um, of the countries are offering some form of pre and in-service training on AMR, but no country has formally incorporated AMR in the training curriculum for health workers in human health. So this is actually an opportunity to target key stakeholders, um, key stakeholder groups. When we look at um, uh, global action plan objective number two on AMR surveillance, 
73% uh, of the countries in the region reported having standardized national AMR surveillance system that collects data on hospitalized and community patients. These countries also have an established network of surveillance sites, national reference laboratory, and a coordinating center producing reports on AMR. And still on objective number two, on monitoring system uh, for antimicrobial consumption and use. This is mainly in uh, human health. 45% of the countries in the region reported having systems to monitor total sales of antimicrobials at national level. So what we have observed also is that globally, this indicator has seen little progress over the years. In the region, we have uh, started a number of activities to strengthen uh, the regional capacity and individual country level capacity in terms of uh, antimicrobial consumption, use monitoring and surveillance. Going to objective number three on infection prevention and control. This is IPC specifically in human healthcare. Most countries in the region reported having national IPC programs that is 63%, but not yet fully implemented in all health facilities. Around 27% of the countries in the region reported having national IPC programs available that and are implemented in all healthcare facilities. Then moving on to objective number four on optimizing antimicrobials in human health. The majority of the countries in the region, that is 64%, reported implementing practices to assure appropriate antimicrobial use in some healthcare facilities, but not all. Still on objective number four, on adopting our way into national essential medicines list. As of 2021, six countries in the region had adopted our way classification into the national essential medicine list. The remaining five countries had knowledge on our way and plan on adopting in the coming years. So what are the recommendations to enhance AMR efforts that are coming up from the tracks? The first one is to strengthen multi-sectorial coordination and collaboration. As we know that AMR is a multi-sectorial, it needs a multi-sectorial approach so that need um, for commitment across sectors from animal health, uh, agricultural sector, and the environment. So that multi-sectorial uh, coordination is important in, uh, uh, in enhancing AMR efforts. The second one is promoting targeted AMR awareness raising campaigns. Then the third is increasing the monitoring and enforcement of legislation involving antimicrobials. From the previous presentation, we noted that uh, in the region, uh, all countries had some sort of legislation in terms of um, controlling antimicrobials. But what is more important after the uh, um, uh, adoption and uh, having the legislation is actually enforcing the legislations and monitoring their impact in terms of uh, monitoring antimicrobials. The fourth one is strengthening access to essential micro antimicrobials and diagnostics. So to strengthen optimum use of antimicrobials, there is need that uh, we strengthen access to essential antimicrobials. We still have pockets of population where access to essential medicine is still a challenge. And yet we also have some pockets of the population where there is overuse of um, essential medicines, including antimicrobials. So there is need to strengthen the access so that those uh, areas that do not have access can uh, have increased access to antimicrobials. Then the last one is strengthening data monitoring and reporting. So this data uh, monitoring and reporting could come through surveillance and through reporting uh, the surveillance that happens uh, in terms of surveillance of um, resistance patterns, and also surveillance and, and uh, monitoring data or with regards to antimicrobial consumption and also use of medicine. So with this recommendation, it is, this can be able to help us going forward in supporting AMR efforts. So thank you very much.
question. Okay. Um, thank you very much. At this point in time, I'll invite Dr. Pem to share on the country experience in Bhutan. Dr. Pem is uh, antimicrobial stewardship um, focal person in uh, uh, JDW National Referral Hospital uh, in Bhutan. So Dr. Pem, it's your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Terence. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank the WHO because uh, many things that I'm going to present has been a success story uh, because of the support from WHO and many other donor, uh, donor part partners, which I'll be presenting. And uh, hello, Sarah. Uh, good to see you after a very long time. So my content of my presentation will be a very brief presentation on our national action plan uh, and then the governance, how it is structured in Bhutan and more about AMS with that also success story as well as what lessons we have learned and what are our way forward strategies. We are very fortunate to be a part of a uh, member state of WHO and we were able to plan or draft our national action plan in line with the global action plan. And this national action plan in Bhutan was for a period of five years from 2018 to 2022. It was all, uh, almost uh, a finalized draft uh, state. And with the help from Fleming, we could really uh, get it endorsed from the highest, board, uh, highest decision making in Bhutan, which is the national parliament. The national action plan is very much aligned to the global action plan. And as we all know, the objectives of global action plan, similar to global action plan, we have seven uh, objectives spelled out in the uh, national action plan. At the same time, the most important uh, uh, element of the National Action Plan is the governance. And in Bhutan, the governance of AMR is a One Health concept or approach. And when I mention One Health uh, concept, we have the human health, the animal health, and the food safety. But we have a plan to revise it in the coming year, 2023, to enforce uh, um, sustainability of many of the activities that we have started with the support from many donor countries or donors partners and at the same time to involve more stakeholders such as environment and wildlife in the near future when we revise the national action plan in terms of governance like I already mentioned, we have a One Health strategy and both the Minister of Health and Minister of Agriculture and Livestock secretaries are on board. And the chairmanship is on rotation every year between the animal and the human health. We have a secretary which is run by One Health uh, secretary, again, involving human health and animal health. And this secretary not only looks after AMR, but also other diseases like zoonotic diseases. As so we try to integrate many of other One Health strategies in together. Of, below that, we have what we call the National AMR Technical Committee. They are the second decision-making body or the recommendations and the guidelines submitted by the technical working group are presented by the National Action, uh, AMR Technical Committee to the IMCO, that is the highest uh, decision-making body in the country. We have the technical working group and like uh, I, I would like to supplement Sarah's uh, flow chart. It's very much aligned to that. And we have technical working groups from both human and animal health who are actually the implementers as well as the ones who make some recommendations and development of guidelines and SOPs. In line with that, we have our Fleming Fund fellows who are the movers and shakers of the uh, technical worker group and have surveillance sites for both laboratory AMR as well as antimicrobial stewardship unit surveillance sites in Bhutan. 
Antimicrobial stewardship in Bhutan to start, uh, it was introduced in 2017 in the National Hospital, which is a 380-bedded tertiary care hospital. When we started the stewardship program in Bhutan, we started with identifying an AMS committee, which is again a multidisciplinary committee, plus a subcommittee, which we call the AMS team. And we started with, with what we call the weekly AMS rounds. With my subsequent slide, I would be uh, presenting what we do with these weekly rounds. As we all know, what is the goal of stewardship is to mainly improve patient outcomes, patient safety, reduce resistance, and also to reduce cost. And when we, when we say stewardship, at the same time, when you want to approach for a financial support, I think it is very important to make a case presentation looking at all these uh, goals. In Bhutan or in the National Hospital, what we have started in 2017 was first was the development or the revision of the National Antibiotic Guidelines. Again, with the support from WHO, the country had been developing uh, the antibiotic guidelines. But in 2017 and 2012, which was five years, every five years review, it was not based on the local antibiogram or susceptibility pattern. But after the establishment of stewardship, we took that initiative to integrate our local antibiogram to the development of national antibiotic guidelines. At the same time, in 2019, we also incorporated the aware classification into the national essential medicine list, as well as national antibiotic guideline. And we are, we are planning to develop the antimicrobial st uh, stewardship strategy in which, again, we would be adopting the aware classification. We also started developing surgical prophylaxis, SOPs, and we, we put the surgeons on board and take the ownership of the surgical prophylaxis guideline and also have made all the surgical department take that as one of the key performance indicator. With regard to interventions, we had started few interventions like the prospective audits. Uh, when I said the weekly rounds, we had rounds targeted on antibiotics and like ceftriaxone, though it is not in the uh, watch category in many of the countries, but for Bhutan, we took that as a, a higher generation uh, uh, watch category and we tried to monitor these use in the inpatient department because of the risks of ESBL already being in, uh, found in the, in the hospital. Then other antibiotics are like vancomycin, ciprofloxacin, carbapenem, piperacillin, tazobactam, and polymyxin and polystein. So these were the antibiotics that we targeted during our weekly rounds. Formula restriction and pre-authorization, again, it is the similar antibiotics that we made us in the antibiotics. But in certain circumstances, like a patient in septic shock, we have a liberty to use it without authorization, but it needs to be reviewed, which is meant by what, what we say, the antibiotic timeout. After 72 hours, we review those patients and we see whether it is necessary to continue those watch or reserve antibiotic. We also implemented the IV to oral switch, and this is one of the very easy or the low hanging fruit to implement a stewardship activity. De-escalation therapy has been a challenge in the country because of our quality of data in the lab, especially in the culture, because of uh, uh, we're not getting very uh, good culture reports in a very uh, appropriate time. The culture reports come very late, so it's quite difficult to de-escalate from higher generation to lower generation. Dose optimization, again, has been a success story in Bhutan because after stewardship was established in 2019, we also established the therapeutic drug monitoring, focusing on these antibiotics. So we could really dose optimize in those patients, example, renal failure, liver failure, or any other uh, conditions. Uh, many of us know this aware classification, so I just wanted to take this uh, platform that we have incorporated this WHO aware categorization in our national antibiotic guideline as well as our national essential medicine list. And very soon we are coming up with the smartphone app where all this classification will be available to our end users. Regarding surveillance, we also started the point prevalence survey in Bhutan on both antimicrobial resistance and use. And this 
surveillance was actually one of the supporting uh, data for us as a country to get some kind of financial support from many other donors or even nationally from the government in Bhutan. We also conduct the surgical prophylaxis. And like I mentioned, the prospective audit data collection has started, but still we struggle with analysis and to generate a quality data. We are also looking at the guideline compliance. Now we have a guideline endorsed and also sensitized. We are looking at the guideline compliance in the country for an antibiotic use. The point prevalence surveys, uh, we have known that there are many survey tools like the WHO tool is there, the global PPS tool is there. But as myself being a Fleming fund, I took this tool from the uh, uh, host institute that is Peter Dohoti in Australia, National Antimicro Prescription Survey, which is a, uh, in a online data uh, software where it helps you do the point prevalence sur surveillance. And the advantage of this data uh, software is that the analysis is generated at the end of the sur survey. So you need not really take a lot of time to analyze or think over. It is already pre-defined uh, or pre-structured. So it is really user-friendly and helpful. And we have generated quite a number of uh, data on terms of antimicrobial use in the three national hospital in Bhutan using this data. With prospective audits, uh, what we call the start smart and then focus, we are not trying to gain the highest at one go, but we are starting very small. In that, what I mean is we are looking at whether when prescribers are documenting their indications, is there a culture of sending culture in patients with sepsis or infection? Is there an allergy mismatch or is there a mismatch between the bug and the drug? which are very feasible to do and it need not have much you know, um, financial support. So we are starting with that, especially to build on our cases of the importance of stewardship in the country and in different hospitals. Guideline compliance, like I already mentioned, we are monitoring the guideline. And very fortunately, Bhutan in 2019, we were part of this uh, WHO AMS toolkit, which really helped us uh, see where we stand as a country for in terms of AMS. It also gives us the focus where we need to uh, prioritize more. Example, in the when we did this toolkit feasibility study in Bhutan, we found there is a national and healthcare facility governance is good, but the way we were planning or doing our interventions were not very systematic. So there was a requirement of AMS strategy, uh, policy documents required. At the same time, whatever we are doing as an intervention of AMS, the impact or the outcome was not being assessed. And at the same time, we found there is a lot of requirement of incorporating AMS into our in-service and pre-service curriculums. So these really, the toolkit really helped Bhutan to move much, much forward. Uh, and also at the same time, build on our cases to again, mobilize a, a financial uh, support from other divisions or other uh, sectors. At the same time, we are again very fortunate with the support from zero WHO, we could do a national analysis using the WHO policy guidance. And the advantage of this policy guidance was they had a very good checklist, which really helped us use that checklist to see where we are falling and where we are excelling as a country. So I think the report will be out very soon, and maybe in another platform, I would take the opportunity to present our situation analysis using this WHO policy guidance. Lessons learned from all, uh, all these years, uh, we need a well-documented healthcare and micro stewardship program or strategy. Bhutan still doesn't have a strategy on AMS, and with the policy guidance and the toolkit, now I feel that it is high time we develop an AMS strategy as a standalone document. Clear terms of reference wasn't there, but again, with the help from all the WHO guidance, there are terms of reference given in the WHO website for AMR. So we adopted that and now we have a clear terms of reference. Part and again, every time we do the situation analysis, we find that 
dental microbial stewardship competency is lacking and there is a requirement of regular competency training to all classifications of healthcare staffs, be it laboratory, be it pharmacy, be it nurse or a physicians. A written hospital policy is also required in a hospital that requires a documentation when you're using uh, antibiotic, a documentation of indication. And at the, at the most, what we felt is the impact of antimicrobial stewardship activities assessment is lacking. And also we are uh, moving towards that, how to assess the impact of AMS. And to end my uh, uh, presentation, before I end my presentation, I would also request WHO that a strategy of AMS during an infectious disease, especially when there's a pandemic is really required because in Bhutan, we struggled a lot to really put AMS principles in a, uh, in a pandemic like COVID because of the fear we all have as it being a very novel disease. Enablers and barriers, we have found a lot of enablers in the country. The NAP is one of the enabler to give antimicrobial stewardship as a priority. And many of those, uh, many of these things that I have put here, I have already mentioned, and I'm fortunate to also inform that now Bhutan is also part of uh, GLOSS WHO, as well as for, both for antimicrobial resistance, as well as antimicrobial consumption, using the WHO tool for antimicrobial consumption. There are a few uh, barriers we have seen, and again, with the policy guidance and the toolkit, we are, have focused on these barriers, how to overcome them, and we are hoping we will have much more uh, uh, impact now with the stewardship at the same time we will have much more better systematic approach on uh, stewardship in the country uh way forward what we are planning is on training of ams competency in the country incorporation of ams principles in both pre and in service curriculums development of ams guideline again we want to align it to the guideline which is already available in the website of who use of who tool for amc and in the healthcare levels and also we would like to use the who pps tool uh, we are eagerly waiting for the who pps tool to do the point prevalence survey and now we are also focusing on to uh, assess the ams outcomes and uh, we are also now incorporating uh, or learning to incorporate or link the AMR data with use and resistance data, use and consumption. We haven't really come to that stage that we can incorporate the uh, uh, data between use and the resistance. And at the end, uh, I would again uh, feel of, I, I would suggest or feel, I feel that we need to have a regional network on antimicrobial stewardship alone. Thank you for this uh, opportunity, and I end my slide with this. Thank you, Terence. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pem, for the excellent presentation. We'll take questions at the end. So at the moment, we shall move on to Nepal and uh, have a presentation from Nepal. This presentation will be in two parts, one by Dr. Madan Kuma Upadaya, who is the Chief Quality Standards and Regulation Division in the Ministry of Health and Population in Nepal, and Mr. Pan Bahadu Shetri, who is the Senior Drug Administrator in the Quality Standard and Regu Regulations Division in the Ministry of Health and Population in Nepal. So at this point in time, I'll hand over to Dr. Madam. Thank you, guys, uh, and good Good morning, good afternoon from Nepal. Namaste. Uh, uh, Jess, will you share the slides? Okay, just a minute. Let me share the slides. Uh, so I first of all, first of all thank uh, WHO for uh, providing this opportunity to share Nepal's, uh, uh, you can say, experience still uh, regarding AMS. Uh, and uh, I we just uh, uh, had a good uh, uh, sharing from Bhutan, uh, their experience in implementing AMR. And there were earlier two presentations, two presentations uh, that we heard uh, our regional status uh, regarding AMR effort and stewardship. So there, there's a long way to go 
but there are few uh, steps what Nepal has been done. Uh, so thank you, Terence. Uh, sorry, I will stop the video sharing with you both network bandwidth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as we all are aware, uh, M AMR uh, is a major threat uh, to human health around the world. And uh, this data we had already aware, the global threat of 700,000 annual death uh, due to the AMR. And financially or economically by 2030, it is estimated of $1 trillion annual loss. So this AMR is a big threat globally and the Nepal is also the part of it. So bacterial AMR magnitude is also high as uh, HIV and malaria with a high burden in our low income countries. So to mitigate this threat, uh, we have a global action plan with us, but Nepal is working on its national action plan uh, regarding AMR. Next slide, please. So, as you can see in this slide, the development of next and next plan of Nepal regarding AMR, uh, it is started uh, from uh, recognizing the AMR threat. Uh, so Nepal became the signatory of Jaipur Declaration uh, in 2011, and Health Minister has, um, signed there was a signatory in Southeast Asia uh, countries showing the, showing the collective regional commitments. So Nepal was also the part of it. So to mitigate the impact of AMR on human health, uh, Nepal committed to develop NAP AMR aligned with global action plan, as I already said, uh, by WHO in 2015, which was further strengthened in a high level, you will general said assembly resolution on 2016. So as a result of it, uh, Nepal developed its national AMR containment action plan in 2016, which has been updated as uh, NAP AMR into 2021 with one health approach. Under the leadership of multi-sector steering committee of uh, AMR. So now we are in the step to expedite the endorsement of this NAP AMR by the government of Nepal, which will be uh, endorsed by the government uh, very soon. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the AMR governance, uh, there is a mechanism of multi-sectoral steering committee on AMR uh, in Nepal, which is the apex body uh, chaired by health secretary. Uh, and the secretary is at Quality Standard and Regulation Division in Ministry of Health and Population, which undertake the policy decisions for implementation of uh, NAP AMR with representation of all sectors along uh, of One Health, human, animal, food, environment, as well as the line ministries uh, such as finance, education, science and technology, communication and information technology. So all line ministries with all the stakeholders uh, they are in the committee, uh, in the steering committee. The key responsibility of this committee is to lead and facilitate the coordination between all national and international uh, response to the threat of AMR. And it also facilitates the endorsement of NAP AMR and it ensures adequate funding to implement NAP AMR. As, uh, as we also already uh, shared that financial aspect it is still the challenge with us. So under the steering committee, National uh, Technical Working Committee of AMR, uh, there is a, which is chaired by the Division Chief of Quality Stand and Regulation Division. Hello, Dr. Madam. Hello, can you hear us? Uh, I think we lost him. 
maybe we can wait just for a minute to see if we can join in. Okay, so I think we need to go to the next presentation on uh, Nepal. Um, oh, oh, okay, thank, thank you for thank you I, for coming back. Yeah, I'm trying again. It's a poor network. Sorry. Will you share the slide? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was talking regarding the governance of the AMR. Uh, there is the multi-sectoral steering committee, which is being led by the health secretary. Uh, and uh, the secretary is the um, quality stand and regulation division in the Ministry of Health. And the me member are from one health approach. They are with human, animal, food, and environment, as well as the line ministries are the member on it. The finance ministry, education, science and technology ministry, Communication Information Technology Ministries are also involved in this steering committee. So its key responsibility is uh, to lead and facilitate the coordination of the national and international response to threat of AMR. And it also facilitates the endorsement of NAP AMR and indoors educate funding to implement NAP AMR. Under this, in the steering committee, there is another committee, uh, which is National Technical Working Committee, which is being led and chaired by the Chief of Quality Standard and Regulation Division. Uh, and they are the stakeholders. Uh, they are all active involved. And the key role of NTWC is to coordinate the activities related to AMR and containment, its containment, and it also facilitates the monitoring and evaluation aspects. The reporting and its reports to steering committee with for the policy level decision making. So we have under it the technical working committees for specific objectives. So they are responsible for providing technical inputs and recommendation related to each strategies priority of the NAP AMR. These all committees are not active yet, but they will be activated following endorsement by the government of Nepal and all report will to the National Technical Working Committee. So there are total, in total, eight technical working committees in five strategic priorities, uh, two in strategy one, one in uh, two second strategic objective, one in third strategic objective, and there are three in strategic of priority four, and one in st strategic objective fifth. So AMS, or uh, antimicrobial stewardship also comes under this and the technical working committee is yet to be activated after the endorsement of NAP AMR of Nepal. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, I think I have a problem. Let me stop sharing. Thank you. So uh, to pointing out the few enablers uh, for NAP AMR implementation, uh, we think that our the functional governance structure, uh, this multi-sectoral steering committee, the national technical working committee, and the technical working committees of the strategic objectives are the enablers. The ownership by the government as one health approach, which ensures sector-wide multidisciplinary involvement, including human, animal, and food health, 
and environment which have been aligned to gap on AMR is another enablers, whereas the development of time-bound busted operational plan, which we are to be it to be endorsed, is another enabler for our NAP AMR and the high engagement of development partners. There are de several development partners working with the government for this NAP. They are working in stewardship, they are working in different AMR efforts. So these partners also are the enablers for NAP AMR uh, for Nepal. Next slide, please. With the enablers, we have few challenges for implementation as uh, these challenges are not one new for us. Uh, different, uh, our regional countries also share the same challenges. We also face the capacity building as the key challenge for NAP AMR implementation because human resource, all lab infrastructures, monitoring and reporting, these all are uh, the challenge we face for the implementation of NAP. Secondly, the dedicated budget, as we already said, I will share, for competing is also the one challenge which uh, we can face for it. And the sensitization or awareness among key stakeholders is the another challenge but, uh, we face. And as in a committee, steering committee and national technical committee, it is with one health approach, there are line ministries. So the coordination between different ministries, different stakeholders, uh, is also here with the challenge. And uh, what we face in Nepal is the members of the committees, they are being frequently government transfers as in here. So it is leading to the law, low institutional memory. So we have to have huge effort to recollect all the previous decisions of previous uh, commitments. And it also, as a result, it is also the challenge for us. Next slide, please. So uh, till that, the lesson learned are still the expand of awareness programs throughout the country. So awareness as it is a challenge. So this is uh, also the lesson learned what we are faced. The strengthening of national reference laboratory and network labs for capacity building on AMR surveillance, the data management and sharing across sectors to inform revision of strategies. And next lesson learned is increased engagement of environment sector. So which we face as a One Health approach, the environment sector, uh, we have to increase the engagement and the strengthen partnership with private sectors. Already we have the uh, partners working with us, the NGOs, INGOs and civil society for a whole of society approach is a lesson learned that we have. Next slide, please. So the next step for NAP AMR implementation will be the expedition of the endorsement of NAP AMR by the government of Nepal to build ownership and strengthen the coordination mechanism among One Health Ministries, as well as line ministries, and map and mobilize the resources for educate financing of NAP AMR implementation because we, uh, the fed, in federal systems, we have uh, the different players in central government, provincial government, local government. So we have to play a vital role in financing also from three, three government. So this uh, is the next step for the implementation of NAP AMR. Uh, so I want to end up my presentation uh, with this. Uh, and I want to uh, thank the WHO colleagues to providing this opportunity to share the uh, progress uh, till date. And I want to request uh, Pan Bahadur Chetri uh, to continue the presentation uh, uh, from his side. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, now I invite Mr. Pan Badu to <clears throat> share his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Terence. So it's a uh, 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 good afternoon and uh, namaste to all of you. So it is so nice to meet you in this uh, webinar uh, meeting. So uh, we have heard so much about uh, uh, in, in the uh, beginning presentation and uh, it's so, it was so encouraging that uh, the tripartite access has been done in 2021 and the uh, status of the is given. So I like to, okay, thank you very much for sharing uh, this, uh, my slide. I have a very brief presentation. I, I don't have more than five, five slides and almost uh, uh, the, the uh, development uh, that we have already done in, in the uh, implementation of the national action plan, it is already uh, described by my chief. So I'll just go in brief, okay. Next slide, please. So uh, focusing on this uh, strategy priority four, that uh, it addresses uh, uh, mainly this uh, uh, regulation of access of high quality antimicrobials and surveillance of antimicrobial use and consumptions and uh, antimicrobial stewardship in human health and antimicrobial stewardship in animal health and rational use of antimicrobials in community settings. So uh, today we are mainly focusing on the antimicrobial stewardship in the human health sector. Okay, next please. So just I want to highlight that what the Nepal has uh, taken the initiative on the strategic four that uh, uh, so far this uh, access of quality, uh, access to quality, safe and effective antimicrobial medicine for the human and animal health sector is concerned. It has been improved uh, because that we have our, uh, uh, the regulatory body that is called the Department of Drug Administration and we have the National uh, Medicine Laboratory. And so uh, by both of these with the coordination of uh, these two, regulatory body that the, uh, we are providing uh, the safe and effective and quality antimicrobial products uh, to our community. And so uh, as a, uh, as a uh, the DDA, the Department of Drug Administration, it is the focal point uh, for the uh, uh, antimicrobial consumption, uh, antimicrobial consumption. So uh, we are, uh, it, we have already started that reporting to antimicrobial consumption data to the uh, this class uh, class, and uh, uh, so far this uh, echo, uh, as per the WHO uh, EML guidelines and according to this aware uh, pro, uh, that uh, uh, recently uh, this uh, national essential medicine list has been revised, and we have categorized. Uh, the antimicrobial uh, as per the, the WHO's uh, guidelines into the access and watch and reserve group. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Mr. Terence. Okay, so <clears throat> that uh, uh, this uh, post marketing surveillance and quality testing of the antimicrobials, uh, um, uh, antimicrobials for animal and uh, animal and human health has been carried out uh, uh, routinely, and uh, we are that uh, this uh, standard antibiotic treatment guideline was published in two thousand fourteen. Uh, so we are uh, right now we are. Uh, uh, revising this uh, uh, antibiotic treatment garden and it is going on. And so uh, hopefully within a short period of time that uh, we'll be able to publish this uh, standard antibiotic treatment guidelines. And so far this uh, uh, point when survey is concerned that we have 
conducted in three sites with the help of uh, uh, FHI 360, and which is the uh, implementing agency for Fleming Fund. So we have already conducted in three uh, uh, three big teaching hospitals. That is the Manipal Teaching Hospitals and Patan Hospital and Tu Teaching Hospitals. And it is uh, 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 three of these. All these hospitals are uh, academic uh, uh, hospitals. Uh, teaching hospitals and they have uh, more than 500 bedded hospitals and uh, so far this uh, uh, IPC guideline is concerned that uh, uh, till date we don't have uh, this uh, uh, national infection prevention guideline so we are uh, drafting uh, the drafting of this national infection prevention guideline is ongoing okay next slide please So uh, this key enablers that I, has already been uh, described by my chief, but I have uh, some points to add on, uh, on it that MA, uh, MS activities are planned under the strategic priority of NAP EMR that, uh, uh, that is a national action plan that we have already, that's uh, MS activities and what are the activities that we are going to do. Uh, it is already described in the NAP EMR and uh, uh, lead entities are identified and uh, uh, and who are the uh, key uh, uh, entities that who are going to lead these activities that is also identified in uh, NAP EMR. And we have already uh, prioritized the, what are the activities that should be done and what will be the costing of the, for the operational plan uh, with the time bound. It is also uh, described in the uh, this uh, national action plan. And key challenges that uh, that NAP AMR endorsement, uh, the main problem is that uh, it is under the process uh, that we don't have that uh, NAP AMR is still endorsement. It is in the final stage. Uh, so hopefully uh, within a short period of time that we'll be able to uh, get the endorsement of this NAP AMR from the uh, cabinet. And so the next step is as Dr. Mohammed mentioned that uh, the endorsement of the NAP AMR. So I think it is the my uh, last slide, and I would like to end with this. Thank you very much. So if any questions uh, there, then I'll try to uh, answer the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Terence. Thank you very much, Mr. Pan Bahadu, for the excellent presentation on Nepal. Um, at this point in time, we'll go through the question and answer section. Okay, um, the first one I'll direct it maybe to, to Dr. Pen. Um, is there any guidance for incorporation of uh, AMR data into AMU and AMC data? Uh, thank you, Terence. Yes, thank you, Terence. Am I audible? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, we do have an AMR and AMU AMC national strategy. But in that strategy, we haven't really definitely said that how to link AMR with AMU and AMC uh, data. But we do have we have spelled out using of healthcare antibiograms uh, into uh, using that to link the antimicrobial use and resistance uh, happening in the hospital setting. So I I, I can only answer. Uh, that um, that one, but I would request maybe Sarah could supplement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. If you can supplement. Yes, thank you. Just to also reiterate, at a minimum, I would fully agree with what Pam has just mentioned: is to ensure that you do bring in the AMR and AMU data in your facility antibiograms to ensure appropriate prescribing guidance to your prescribers. Unfortunately, at when it comes to national level, we from WHO do not yet have any specific guidance, but it is currently being developed as we see this as a critical gap. So it's great that you're asking the questions 
because we will make sure that we meet that demand. I have posted in the Q&A that there has been, it's, it's from the European region, there has been one document that tries to show how the data could be linked. So I encourage you to have a look at that to see if there are any areas that could be applicable to your setting. And hopefully within the next year or two, we will also have guidance from our side. But at a minimum, I think where the action is needed is at facility level. And here to develop antibiograms, there is guidance also in the WHO AMS toolkit, as well as um, other specific guidance. I will post a link in the chat. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, for the next question, I'll direct to maybe Dr. Madan Kuma. Um, can you please elaborate on the effort that is that has been done in Nepal in establishing medicines and therapeutic committees as this allows um, antimicrobial stewardship activities? Um, okay. Just to add on, <clears throat> just sorry, this, just to add on, there's another question on Nepal. So um, while we're talking about hospital uh, drugs and therapeutic committee, <clears throat> The question is asking about uh, how to ensure antimicrobial stewardship programs in Nepal uh, when there is limited uh, or limited capacity for pharmaceutical care or, or, or hospital pharmacy role in the hospital. So maybe these are some of the interlinked questions that you may be able to answer. And maybe later on, there's also a question about um, the involvement of the private sector in Nepal. So given the limited time, it would be great if um, Nepal colleagues could um, try and address these questions in a go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Terence, for uh, the query. Uh, I also saw in the chat box. Uh, uh, for, regarding the private sector involvement in antimicrobial stewardships, uh, there are private medical colleges, private hospitals uh, working on it. Uh, they have uh, uh, the committee, they, have, they are uh, involved in the AMS uh, program also. Uh, the group of technical assistants uh, along with Henry Ford has some support in training and uh, stewardship uh, programs. Uh, we have uh, this in our surveillance uh, sites also uh, and uh, some not all hospitals or medical colleges have therapeutic uh, committees uh, with them, but the hospitals or colleges where they promote uh, antimicrobial stewardships, they ha have already the committees working on, on the support of AMS and uh, they closely work with the government regarding this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Pam, do you want to add? Uh, yes, just I, 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 I just want to supplement on, uh, on the Dr. Madan Supadhyay's uh, remarks that uh, in the, some of the uh, institutions, private institutions, they, uh, they, they have their own uh, antimicrobial stewardship, but not at all, in all uh, health institutions. But uh, 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 but it is not formally informed to the Ministry of Health and Population. So we are not much aware of how many, uh, so uh, if, uh, as for example, you know that the uh, model hospital, model hospital which is running in the Kathmandu, and the, uh, that we know from other sources that they have their one antimicrobial restorative shifts over there. But uh, in fact, uh, 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 that uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Health and Population is not aware of that. So if any person who comes to the ministry and if they say that we have started and that we have uh, our one, uh, this uh, AMS system, then then at that time we can only say that, okay, but we, we can know the, 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 the situation of the AMS. But uh, so uh, until and unless, we do not endorse that NAPMR in the implementation phase. Then once it is uh, implemented, then every health institution, they must have their one AMS antimicrobial towards safe. And in that condition, 
that the government, uh, the Ministry of Health and Population can intervene every each and every health institution to establish their one uh, anti-migrant is towards it. So uh, th this is my saying, uh, just to add on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe because of our time, I'll just take one last question uh, directed to Nepal again. Uh, does the next NAP of Nepal have any hard targets or aspirational targets um, that have been set for reducing consumption usage or reduction in resistance? Just in one minute. Dr. Bada Nkuma. Or Mr. Pam, if you want to respond. Friends. Uh, Hello. Yes, go ahead. Hello, uh, yes, you, go uh, ahead. Can, uh, can you repeat the question, please? Okay, uh, the question was that, uh, do, does the next NAP of Nepal have any hard targets or aspirational targets that have been set for reducing consumption, usage, or reduction in resistance? Any hard targets or aspirational targets that are in the next NAP? It's not clear to me. The question is actually uh, requesting if there is any targets that have been set up in the next national action plan that you are in the process of endorsing. I hope I'm clear. Oh yes, so that uh, that national action plan that uh, that is almost in the final stage and it it needs to be endorsed by the cabinet. Am I clear? So yes, sure. So once that NAP AMR is endorsed by the cabinet, then it will go into the actions. Then we'll make a plan accordingly. Okay. So in that situations that uh, we can uh, we can uh, say uh, we can uh, request we can uh, convince. Uh, to the health facilities to have their one uh, IPC committee, drug and therapeutic committee, and this AMS committee, like this. So, uh, so our main uh, next step is to to uh, endorse that uh, NAP AMR from the cabinet. Am I clear to your answer? Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have run out of time. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us for the inaugural webinar. And I would like to specially thank our panelists, um, Dr. Sarah, uh, Dr. Madan Kuma Upadaya, Mr. Pan Bahadu Khetri, and Dr. Pam Chuki for taking your time to uh, develop the presentation and share with us your experience in terms of uh, NAP um, antimicrobial resistance uh, action plans that you uh, that you are actually undertaking. Um, at this point in time, I would like to remind the participants that this is uh, going to be a monthly webinar series starting in March. The next webinar will be in April. Uh, the communication will be sent to you. Uh, please follow us on the website that I have shared. I will share again the website link that will have all the details. And the next webinar will be on the pharmacology of antimicrobials and uh, resistance. So it will be an exciting webinar and, um, and looking forward to having you again in this uh, webinar series. So thank you very much for joining us. And um, we have come to the end of the webinar. Goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. bye. See you next month. Thank you. <clears throat>
see you next month thank you very much thank you thank you bye <clears throat>